for right now. Let go. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. And if the chair does come in and say, what are you doing? <laughs> We're not even scheduled to be at this time, so this could be a little bit crazy. But uh, hopefully you have our high-budget, uh, high-tech um, uh um, uh, gifts for you today. <laughs> we're here to talk a little bit about maybe what we're hoping is a, a new frontier. I'm Yvonne. Uh, I've been around at uh, Oopsa Splash for a long time and I'm really happy to be here today because I really feel like there are opportunities out there that as Just an academic, yeah. oh, I'm sorry our chair is here. <laughs> <laughs> is it okay that we started? <laughs> Sorry, is that okay? <laughs> I asked out there, did this just go? Oh, sorry, okay. Oh, well, you've got to get, here you go. <laughs> okay. As an academic, I feel like sometimes, you know, the, uh, the cart is leading the horse or something. The students come up to me and they're like, oh, this is great. This is really exciting. I want to go and I want to I wanna do something in the virtual reality space and I want to do things in Rust and I want to do things, and all these things that I'm just like, Wow, I am so not ready to do that with you. But I'm very lucky because every now and then you get uh, some fabulous people through the program, <laughs> finishing up a PhD who happens to be uh, somebody who has experience in industry and has much more to say about what's going on in this new frontier than I as an academic do. But I do want you to know that I believe that there's a lot of opportunity in this space for us. And what we want to talk about today is a little bit of where these opportunities might be for this community to dive in and help with what's going on here. So I'm Yvonne and this is Derek. And this is still yours. <laughs> <And it's laughs> still I just wanted to give that background of, you know, it's not like it's new. <laughs> this idea of uh, having some kind of fresco where you walk into a room and those really aren't windows looking out over the, over the beautiful view there. That's all just supposed to be painted to give you the sense that you're walking into this different environment. So virtual reality, definitely something we could relate to as being around and something we were interested in for a long time, maybe in a different form back in the 1500s. <laughs> Great. So from 1591 virtual reality uh, to 1920s virtual reality, uh, I'm Derek Jacoby, a uh, uh, recent uh, graduate out of uh, UVic with uh, Yvonne here, uh, and uh, have a, uh, a company called Qbert, uh, where I've been working with uh, industry and an academic industry partnership uh, to uh, uh, do virtual reality applications, not based in our 1920s uh, uh, glasses uh, technology, of course, uh, but something much more recent and up-to-date uh, that we'll be talking about through this talk. Uh, but if I were here in the 1920s, this would be high-tech, and that's what we gave you. So really, you know, what's going on out there, maybe you've seen, have a lot of people been looking at what's happening with HoloLens and Microsoft and some of the applications that they've been doing? This is just a little clip from their ad that is talking about, hey, in this application space where we're building these robots, we use these HoloLens augmented reality, virtual reality headsets to be able to do rapid prototyping, to be able to share the experience with co-designers and to be able to modify the design on the fly. This saves us money, it's absolutely fantastic, it's gonna change the world. Obviously, that's marketing, but that's one, one point in the space. Uh, of course, we've been here before, and uh, the claims for virtual reality uh, have gone through this cycle of uh, uh, huge expectations and crashing down to the ground uh, uh, several times. Even as far back as the 1990s, they had the uh, big bulky headsets and uh, making all these claims for virtual reality. Uh, and they fell into the second phase of technology uh, uh, disillusion, this, this, this uh, trough of disillusionment. And usually when something falls into this trough, uh, uh, it just cycles off and it's gone. We don't hear about it again for a few years. Uh, this time, though, we've got enough critical mass uh, in uh, virtual reality uh, that we think we're actually going to uh, fly through this trough and end up on this uh, a, a slope of enlightenment. Uh, uh, and these are kind of Y Combinator startup technology uh, terms uh, around this stuff, uh, kind of silly terms. But uh, there is this critical mass of technology uh, that lets you get past this peak of expectations where everything's, uh, you know, one thinks it can do anything uh, uh, through the crash where uh, people believe, oh, it can't do, uh, uh, do a thing. It's useless. Uh, and uh, it's actually useful for something. And right now what's carrying us out of this trough is primarily gaming. But it's not going to stay with gaming. Uh, and we actually have productivity questions uh, and productivity applications coming up. So just a quick overview. I have to speak into his lapel if you're wondering why we're doing this weird thing. <laughs> a quick overview. We want to give you a background, a little bit of the hardware. Maybe how many people have seen a lot of the hardware associated with VR already? 
Okay, so very quickly, we'll go over a little bit of the hardware and what it, where we're at with that. A little bit of the tooling. This is where, where it's kind of a cry for help from this community, in my um, opinion anyway. Uh, beyond the tooling that's directly related to VR right now and gaming, we can talk about the enabling technologies. And here we're thinking about how we're going to move this technology into spaces like data science, data exploration, these different types of application areas. And once we get through all of this, we're going to be able to really answer questions that our stakeholders are asking us right now. And that's all about this user interaction model. Will you be able to take our application and make it so that our users enjoy this prolonged engagement? Uh, different than what we're doing right now, can you build something that's going to keep them in this exploratory data study? Can we enable some more rich group interaction? Again, on our side, we said, why aren't we doing this this conference in Second Life, because that was how we were going to all do conferences for a while. But can it really, truly give us collaboration? And then can we use all of this technology to be able to actually promote what's going on in exploratory data science? So basically, these are our kind of, are we there yet questions <laughs> that we want to ask. And we'll start off at the top here with these VR devices. So moving right into that. If we go, that's okay. This, <laughs> this uh, you know, again, I go back to the ancient history here, and we've just got a picture there of, you know, these are the people that are looking at the double helix for the first time and building these models and showing everybody, hey, this is what DNA, DNA really looks like. And to really appreciate it, we need to build something physical, something that makes you appreciate the 3D structure. That's, again, of course, something that we're after in this space. Um, as, you know, our entertainment industry led us into these kind of experiences, you're probably all too young, but maybe, you know, uh, 20,000 leagues under the sea and uh, um, a journey to the center of the earth. This was our imaginings of what it would be like if we could go to different worlds and experience these things. And certainly, I don't know if anybody had ever seen this. I hadn't before, but the Sensorama. You can actually hold on and sink your head into the, the little cubby hole there and pretend that you're riding a motorcycle through a city. And what you get is the rumble of the seat, and you get the wind in your hair, and you get the smell of the city through the Sensorama. So none of this is new, right? <laughs> That's 1962. And also, of course, we're interested in ourselves, and we're interested in biology, and we're interested in applications <coughs> there. And again, maybe people don't remember this movie. But being able to go inside the human body and explore it in 3D, what is it really like? So all of these things sort of, I think, provide context for what we're after. There were head-mounted displays. I don't, know, I, I don't know if people had seen this before. But this is around 1968, and there they were. They were trying to get this augmented reality. And not only was it something that you would be able to experience through the goggles, but at least you didn't have to carry the headset and look crazy. It was actually mounted in the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a lot of examples along those lines. Sure. We've come quite a ways from uh, the 1968 uh, VR headset, though. Uh, and one of the things I wanted to do in this next section of the talk is very quickly fly through some of the hardware devices that we're depending on for this iteration through uh, virtual reality. Uh, and they're really becoming consumer devices very quickly uh, and becoming uh, very accessible research tools because uh, targeted consumers, you can't have price points in the uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands like these devices were even just a few years ago, uh, but in the hundreds. Uh, and so uh, up here on the uh, left uh, is the Gear VR. Uh, this is a sub-$100 device if you have the uh, right uh, phone to go into it. Uh, uh, otherwise, it's a several-hundred-dollar phone and a uh, sub-$100 device. Uh, um, but uh, the one on the other side, uh, the HTC Vive, uh, is the uh, first VR headset uh, uh, that had the motion controllers. Uh, and this is really important for a lot of the interactions we'll be talking about in terms of data exploration. Uh, in that uh, it's not just seeing in 3D. We have a lot of things that 3D is just not useful for. Uh, but as soon as you start using 3D and actually uh, interacting with it as a physical environment, uh, it becomes more useful and engaging. And so we're going to talk about the types of problems that are actually applicable to this type of interaction. Um, so the other uh, devices you see here in the center, uh, you've got the Oculus Rift. Uh, they're coming out with the motion controllers for the Rift uh, here uh, next month, I believe. Uh, and uh, so it'll be very much on par with the HTC Vive at that point. Uh, here on the bottom uh, right, uh, we have the PlayStation VR. Uh, not as much as a, a perhaps a, a serious computing device, uh, but in terms of uh, its virtual reality capabilities, it's just as capable as the other devices I've talked about. We even have an open source VR headset, uh, the OSVR, uh, that's coming along. 
And lest I give you the impression that uh, uh, these headsets are uh, kind of at the point they're going to stay, uh, uh, coming right down the pipe, we have some other hardware. Uh, this is the Fove VR, uh, a forthcoming headset uh, uh, this spring uh, that uh, also has built-in eye tracking. Uh, so with all these headsets, you have head tracking, so you can tell where your head is pointing. Uh, but the Fove VR can get within one degree where your eyes are actually pointing within that headset, uh, which leads to lots of capabilities like foveated rendering, where you only render in high resolution the portion of the screen you're looking at. Uh, but also for uh, other applications, uh, it just lets you track the area that a user is attending to uh, and uh, do these eye beam to drill in kind of interactions uh, that we'll talk about in a minute. We also, along the uh, way, have uh, capabilities for motion sensing that play into this. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to uh, introduce the, cogn uh, the concept of augmented reality uh, and uh, what that depends on in terms of sensors. But uh, even prior to that, just knowing where your limbs are, where you're uh, doing and interacting with the scenes, uh, uh, motion capture becomes a big thing. It can either be through uh, camera, uh, depth sensor uh, kind of interfaces, uh, or there's now uh, this uh, perception neuron that we see in the lower left there. Uh, uh, even a couple of years ago, this would have been a $100,000 uh, motion capture suit in the film industry. Uh, it's now a $1,500 suit uh, that captures 32 joint angles uh, uh, it with very high precision. So all of this hardware that allows us to uh, immerse yourself into these virtual environments uh, is becoming commoditized and very much cheaper. We're primarily in this talk uh, uh, speaking of virtual reality. I'm going to talk about augmented reality as well, uh, but uh, when I showed that graph of uh, uh, yeah, the peak of uh, expectations, the trough of disillusionment, the slope of uh, a, a, a product of enlightenment, uh, uh, augmented reality is further back than virtual reality is. Uh, we'll get there, and it has tremendous applications, uh, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, for augmented reality to be successful, uh, you need not only to have the uh, creation of the models, the creation of the displays in front of you, but also the understanding of the real world that you're looking at. Uh, and this understanding of the real world uh, is a much more challenging problem. Uh, we do, though, have HoloLens and Magic Leap, and even to some extent uh, things like Google Glass starting to hit that uh, augmented reality problem. Uh, uh, but I don't know that it's, that it's this cross across that graph that, uh, that we get those absolutely solved. A couple other technologies that play into this and make all of this possible. Uh, uh, the CGI in movies for many years, of course, has been the main driver to 3D graphics. Uh, and this has been what's primarily building the tool chain that uh, enables us to do virtual reality. Uh, so you have tools like Autodesk Maya and uh, 3D Studio Max, uh, all of these 3D uh, modeling tools that really are the basis for doing virtual reality. Uh, and one of the things that this has led to uh, is a, uh, a fragmentation of the tool chain that allows us to do this. And we'll dig into tool chains in a uh, few minutes here. Uh, this is one of the places that if we get a more consistent tool chain, our experiences we deliver to users uh, can be much more consistent. Uh, the HoloLens, uh, I just wanted to have this slide here to point out that uh, when we're talking augmented reality devices, the main way that you can tell immediately is that you can see through the clear uh, lens there. Uh, and uh, yeah, the HoloLens is uh, yeah, doing things like just looking for flat surfaces to put your Minecraft game on here. Uh, and so it's a yeah, very thin veneer of augmented reality. Uh, identifying a flat surface is something that you can do with uh, image recognition right now. Uh, uh, people are pushing a lot further than that, though. Uh, and uh, uh, this BMW commercial, uh, they're uh, yeah, yeah, planning in the uh, yeah, 2021 uh, kind of uh, kind of time frame to uh, release a motorcycle that you require an augmented reality headset for. Uh, and that uh, does road and position angles and all the rest. Uh, and I don't believe in this in the least yet, because the problem of trying to do in real time uh, uh, object recognition of everything you're seeing and representing the graphics in your, uh, in your uh, headset uh, in a way that it uh, improves your writing experience instead of distracting you uh, is a really hard problem on many, many levels. Uh, and so this is really why I'm saying the augmented reality curve uh, is some distance behind the virtual reality curve. Um, in either case, though, uh, it is an industry that's building very quickly. Uh, it's uh, just this year, uh, the first time is going to be uh, bigger than a billion dollar industry, uh, which uh, means it really has arrived. Uh, uh, most of this is still in hardware sales. Uh, we do have uh, software coming up very quickly behind it, though. Uh, it's projected to grow uh, to, uh, in this Goldman Sachs report uh, uh, to being about a $16 billion industry uh, by 2025. Uh, and in some ways, this is a very conservative estimate. Uh, uh, some of the other estimates uh, push it even much higher than that. But the interesting thing that I want to show you in this one uh, is that it's not gaming-based, uh, that the predictions of the market size for virtual reality at this point are uh, really predicated on breaking out of gaming into these productivity applications. Uh, and so the meat of today's talk is really uh, about uh, what do we have to do to get this from being a gaming technology to being a uh, useful scientific visualization technology. Um, 
beware of the hype a little bit. Uh, some of these other studies, Juniper Research just released a uh, study saying it'll be a $50 billion industry by 2021, driven by gaming. Uh, um, there's a lot of hype here, and, and partially one of the problems in this space uh, is separating the media hype from, uh, uh, from the reality and the tools that we can actually uh, make use of. But it, there is stuff underlying the hype. And uh, for instance, in China, they uh, are uh, uh, in the uh, real estate industry. Uh, it's hard to buy a house these days without having a virtual reality headset thrust on your face uh, during the uh, shopping process. Uh, and we're getting that direction here as well, but uh, uh, more slowly than perhaps these technologies are being uh, uh, deployed in China. There is some reality behind the hype, uh, just perhaps not that 50 billion in, uh, in five years reality. I'm going to believe, Derek. <laughs> that we really are there with the hardware for VR that you know and I certainly I don't just get it from students I get it from stakeholders who want to do joint projects and say okay Yvonne what we really want to do is we want you to build some kind of uh, application that's going to use virtual reality and I'm just kind of like okay um, <laughs> let's, let's look into that so now if we take a look at some of the studies and applications so as an academic I go okay well let me just see what's out there and I just want to give you a quick view of two that uh, that might stand out, one of them uh, being a, a study out of Caltech in about 2013, which isn't the most recent, but it was one of the ones that sort of said, hey, we want to use virtual reality for exploratory data analysis. And you can see this is the regular headset, there's a leap there, the student is manipulating the data set through gestures. This is kind of what we're talking about and kind of what we're thinking of and kind of what um, uh, stakeholders arrive expecting us to be able to do. Um, if we move on here, we'll see they actually started more in a kind of a second life 2D world, and then they moved into a virtual reality world. That's okay. <laughs> this, again, sorry, we're tied together here. <laughs> so they, they actually built something that, that it's called iViz, and I don't think it's open source, but you can take a look, and, they, and this is the one where they're leveraging the different technology. And they didn't do a user study, and they don't have results like that, but it is something, in a point in the space that's interesting. And they're using something called Unity, and we'll talk a little bit about that. They also were really specific that they wanted to promote collaboration. But the question for maybe this community, too, is what does collaboration really look like in these environments for these different type of applications? They're trying to look at it in the context of a data analysis kind of study, and they're saying collaboration means I broadcast my view, my perspective, my camera to everybody else so they can see what I'm looking at. Um, maybe there might be different zoom levels available, but that was as far as they got on the collaboration mode. And you can see that other industries are pushing that much further, but on data analysis, it's a start. Another study that was out there that's kind of interesting, and, and certainly uh, it from MIT, and it was about 20, I think I put 2014. Um, uh, and this was, hey, this is going to, again, I always think about how exciting this sounds. We're going to use virtual reality to understand what's happening in the Twitter space around MIT. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and it is awesome. And I know, <laughs> but, you know, ultimately they've got the VR glasses. They've got a uh, model of the campus. Um, you might not be able to see this, but these are little tweets that are going up from different... <laughs> so all of a sudden I'm like, wow, I'm not <laughs> sure that's awesome, but okay. They keep going, so you get the overview of the location. You can start to filter and, and zoom, so you get to be able to do a query. Maybe you just want to see the tweets from that building over there. <laughs> you get this big string of them. They actually go on different walls, you query, and you can actually reach in and get information drilled into the details about specific tweets. <laughs> Uh, again, you know, an interesting study and a starting of well, how are we going to do this in a 3D space. But maybe the takeaway here is it's difficult. Yeah. A and choose your space wisely. Uh, um, a as we get out of the pure academic realm, uh, we get people jumping on the hype train for, uh, for VR in various ways that uh, really may have something going for them. Uh, if you're in a hospital bed in a whole lot of pain, uh, uh, putting on your virtual reality headset and just letting the current world you're in go away and sinking into another world uh, can be very effective. Uh, um, uh, they are actually showing effectiveness in the immersive environment uh, of uh, greater than opioids in some cases, just by keeping people engaged on something other than themselves and uh, quitting focusing on their own bodies. Uh, and uh, so you can also see, uh, even in a uh, paralysis uh, kind of uh, a, a situation, uh, 
uh, that virtual world can be so compelling uh, that uh, uh, you can train uh, uh, your body to think that you're actually moving when you're not, just getting micro movements of your muscles. Uh, um, and they're actually uh, showing that there's some evidence that you can uh, get some neuronal connections being restored uh, through tricking your brain into think you're uh, thinking you're doing things. Um, so in, in medicine uh, realms and uh, tricking yourself into these, uh, believing in these virtual world realms, uh, maybe there's something there, uh, but this doesn't necessarily tell us uh, things that are actionable from a, uh, a computer science, scientific visualization perspective. Uh, um, if you uh, look at uh, some things closer to home here, uh, even at uh, the uh, Science Museum here in Amsterdam, uh, uh, they've got a group set up uh, that uh, are uh, using virtual reality uh, for uh, virtual supermarkets uh, uh, to look at shopping behavior and behavior moving through the world of people with uh, brain injuries. Uh, and uh, so uh, using virtual reality to uh, simulate environments uh, in a way that they're more easily studyable with special populations is another place that uh, we've been starting to uh, see success there. Uh, again, though, this is primarily industry driven uh, and uh, driven by uh, specific content domains. Uh, and so it's a place that uh, I its core computer science uh, researchers uh, are perhaps a little bit behind where the industry researchers uh, yeah, getting caught up in the, yeah, the potentials of virtual reality are. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to do here was uh, start to uh, tease apart uh, just what a uh, key, uh, key problem is for a good problem that's uh, amenable to virtual reality uh, and what is not. Uh, if you look to media and gaming, uh, you get lots of examples of what is not. We've talked about minority report user interfaces for years. Uh, and everybody got caught up uh, a, a decade or so ago uh, in let's just sweep things. Let's uh, interact with these giant screens. Uh, and uh, for the most part, it's hype. For the most part, it's junk. Uh, it's just not the way that you want to work with a, a good human factors design. Uh, when you're sweeping your big things to the side, you're getting repetitive strain injury and moving a lot when you could just move a mouse. Uh, it's just not a good interactivity uh, model. Uh, uh, moving further forward, we have things like the Iron Man series. That's basically another form of sweeping. It's got some 3D around there. Uh, um, but it's really driven by, uh, a, a, again, hype and what's exciting and what projects well and displays well in movies uh, and not what really serves our users well. Uh, and so uh, we do have to uh, think about uh, you know, what is the best problem space to uh, be shown in virtual reality. Um, some of the ideas that we get through here, though, are from gaming. Uh, and gaming is furthest ahead of all of this right now, of course. Uh, uh, very rapidly evolving, taking best advantage of the new hardware. Uh, and what we get out of the gaming industry uh, is using virtual reality uh, to uh, get that initial engagement, to grab people and pull them into the game. Uh, the virtual reality isn't necessarily what keeps them there. Uh, uh, that uh, we haven't shown through gaming that uh, uh, virtual reality is the long-term prolonged engagement mechanism. Uh, the gamification of the gaming UIs really takes care of that. Uh, uh, people have played games in 2D for a long time and get very uh, gripped by them as well. Uh, but you can count on virtual reality as being that initial engagement device to get them pulled into the environment. Uh, uh, so you have things like Tilt Brush. Uh, uh, so the uh, Victoria Makerspace, which is a, uh, a technology collective that I run in Victoria, BC, uh, um, we uh, got an HTC Vive and, uh, and all of our uh, tour groups when they come through, we put the headset on. Uh, and this is the environment that I immediately put most people in. Uh, it's a, uh, a 3D painting program, basically. So you have your controllers uh, and you uh, draw with light stripes all around you. Uh, and the experience of being in this sculpture of light that you're drawing and uh, pulling over your head and, uh, and building this three-dimensional canvas uh, is so much more compelling than a two-dimensional canvas uh, that there's something there to the interactivity. Yeah, the desire of all of us to be wizards, to uh, really control our environment utterly, uh, um, just uh, lends itself in these uh, creations in the, uh, the gaming industry. Of course, we have uh, limitations. Uh, right now at Makerspace, we have one headset. Uh, and so one of the limitations that uh, that has is one person can experience at a time. Uh, so developing new collaboration strategies that get around this limitation, one of the neat games out there is uh, keep talking and nobody explodes. The idea behind this one uh, is the person that has the headset on, all they can see is this bomb. It's this complex bomb that they have to diffuse. Uh, and it's only the people that don't have the headset on that have the, uh, yeah, the manual that tells them how to diffuse it. And so the person with the headset on has to say things like, uh, okay, on the left-hand side, there's a, uh, a set of four wires. One of them's blue, one of them's red uh, with stripes, and two are solid red. Uh, uh, and the person with the manual is leafing through and finding the picture and going, cut the blue one, cut the blue one. Uh, and if you're wrong, your headset blasts and blows up, and you're trapped in this virtual exploding world, uh, which is actually kind of fun. Uh, but, uh, you know. Um, HTC Vive uh, and uh, Valve uh, have been one of the leaders in the uh, gaming space so far. Uh, uh, and also in creating the content for these spaces. Uh, so what we're looking at here uh, is an experience called the lab. Uh, the lab is kind of a playground of different interaction methods. Uh, and uh, 
You can see uh, in the picture on the bottom right the person with the controllers, uh, and uh, they are uh, reaching into various spaces and waving to the uh, little guys over there, uh, uh, basically treating them as an extension of their body. Uh, and uh, you can see in a minute here uh, yeah, that uh, he'll uh, respond to the bouncing guy uh, and uh, go forward with a teleportation mechanism. Uh, and that uh, method you just saw of him uh, uh, running his little green uh, uh, circle out and then releasing the, uh, the button to uh, zoom forward, uh, because we don't really have walking capabilities in here yet. Uh, this is coming. There are things uh, yeah, that are 3D treadmills that are coming along to allow you to walk in these virtual environments. Uh, but right now, you're in kind of a cube of space that it can detect. And uh, to move around, you have to use these slightly unnatural teleportation mechanisms. Uh, you can see that he just uh, reached in and grabbed a globe and pulled it to his face, and that moved him into this next uh, uh, virtual environment. Uh, so we're inventing all of these uh, interaction mechanisms uh, that, are, uh, that are brand new, uh, that are things that we have to figure out what works best. Uh, and uh, some of the things going on in the lab are uh, yeah, really just leading to uh, different ideas of how to do this. Cloudhead Games is the next one that I wanted to talk about. Uh, they've taken some of the lab approaches and then just made them uh, incredibly higher fidelity. Uh, and so they're going the photorealistic approach in their rendering, uh, and you have to explore your world around you to find these cues uh, and these clues uh, uh, to help you explore the world. Uh, and in some cases, you have to uh, literally get down on your knees and crawl under a barrier to get to the other side of it and poke back up. Uh, so there's a real physicality to a lot of these virtual environments uh, that actually helps the engagement in these uh, environments incredibly. Yeah. Um, jumping back out to something that uh, is a little bit more uh, relevant to the uh, collaboration question, uh, We've got a program called Big Screen. Uh, and uh, so what Big Screen does uh, is it uh, yeah, just allows you to share screens with people around you. You can see that there's a, a little floating disembodied head there with a monitor in front of it, uh, and another monitor on the left, which is our uh, a, a monitor for our floating disembodied head our neighbor is seeing. Uh, and we're watching a movie together uh, in the uh, big screen in front of the, uh, the monitors. Uh, um, so it's really a very primitive and clumsy uh, virtual world in a lot of ways. Uh, I don't even have a body. I'm just a floating head uh, with a few pixels around me. Uh, but the uh, degree of immersion and engagement in this world uh, is really quite incredible for the amount of technology that, did that, that went into it, uh, uh, that you do feel like you're sitting next to somebody and watch a movie or play, uh, sitting next to somebody and, and playing a game. Uh, it's almost as good as being on a couch next to them. Uh, and so uh, some of the techniques we have to use to uh, promote this collaboration and this engagement, uh, this engagement uh, are not that complicated for the uh, results that you get out of them. Of course, this uh, field is moving really quickly, and the few uh, that I showed you that are uh, kind of the key things that are coming up these last couple months won't be the key things a few months from now. Uh, and uh, so uh, check out qbert.com uh, over time. Uh, we uh, run these uh, sessions on there where we look at the latest uh, virtual reality applications, specifically with a view of what can we learn from the gaming community uh, to carry back into the academic community, uh, community uh, and to the scientific visualization community. And we do this uh, in a uh, big screen session. Professor McKee. So I'm going to say that, you know, and I hope I was watching some of you, it was like you had to look away from <laughs> some of that video because it is, it's amazing what's going on out there, but some of it is, wow, I don't know, can I get my first year students to experience programming in this kind of environment? I don't know how to do it, but I think it would be really cool. But I'll give it to Derek that, you know, in terms of the applications, they're there. Studies, we need more studies. We need more user studies. We need this community to jump into this space, I think. There's certainly a lot of players in the space. And this is just a list from the Goldman Sachs report that is talking about how, how big this industry is going to be. And we have our own uh, stakeholders that are arriving all the time at UVic <laughs> that are asking for us to get into this space and to be able to produce things for them, let alone our students who want to jump in and do it too. So some of our stakeholders closer to home really are on campus. We have something called Ocean Networks Canada, and this is some uh, an underwater exploratory uh, survey um, uh, situation. And we also have Earthcast, which is a company, a startup company, who's going to be able to make data that's available from satellites and other imagery from space available to everyone, data scientists, citizen scientists, to be able to explore. And these kinds of stakeholders, and, and uh, there are others too, are asking us, again, to build compelling user interfaces that are much like what's going on in that gaming industry to bring them into it all. So when we take a look at some of this, uh, one of the things that we do, first of all, at least again, I'm uh, identifying with the academic perspective, I go to the luminaries from uh, information visualization, like Ben Schneiderman, and he says, hey, the way you have to do this is you have to provide an overview first 
And that, so, and, and, and again, you can see it with the MIT study, the overview of the campus first. Then you have to allow people to zoom and filter while they can maintain some form of context as to where they are. And then you can drill into the details. And I think this mantra from the InfoViz community is going to help guide us with these kinds of applications. So, but we definitely have challenges. And this is, I'm just bringing one up. And again, many different perspectives here. But here's an example of taking some of the data that's in future trading or financial analysis, or maybe it's a, a Google Analytics spreadsheet or something like this about what's going on with your website. But some of these uh, data sources being moved into this space, there's questions about how effective it really is. And again, not a lot of studies yet, and certainly lots of work to do on the tools chain. But here you're seeing a, a, a desk that was built specifically for using this application, this virtual reality application, to be able to move through this futures data. And the question is, does that interface really add value for this user? And I think we have more examples that we've come across out there. And here's, we're using the eye tracking that Derek was talking about with the, with the headset. And we're sharing, collaborating on a data set. And here it is sort of represented on the, on the floor of our office here. And here you are. Apparently, you know, our colleague doesn't wear any clothes is one thing. <laughs> 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 and then the other thing is they've got laser vision. I don't know. Is this really, is this the manifestation of the interface yet? Maybe it is, and I'm just, uh, you know, projecting my, <laughs> 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 I'm collaborating with you. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, you know, maybe we're, maybe this isn't it yet. Again, I don't want to, maybe it is for people, so. But, um. We look at dashboards in particular and all of the things that we might want to be able to move into this space. We've got some advice for people that want to get into it, <laughs> or at least our experience has been uh, the kinds of applications that will potentially benefit early on from this right away. It's easy to see how maybe these dashboards, it would be nice, but if we were to look at some other applications that we'll talk about that we're working on right now. One of them's with Ocean Networks Canada. There's a natural mapping to where you are in the ocean with this, and this is just a plankton bloom. And another one is uh, actually bioinformatics with Derek over there. So if we take a look at Ocean Networks Canada, they have sensors everywhere in British Columbia, all over the ocean floor. We've even, we've even uh, loaded some onto our ferries, and we're collecting an enormous amount of data. How do we make that data available to citizen scientists and make it compelling through using virtual reality? Well, here's a sample of the data set from their website. And not to go into detail, but this is just, we have all of these instruments in all of these different positions, and we're seeing the instrument readouts in these kind of siloed fashion. This is actually information about what's going on on a water column at different depths. And each one of these graphs is showing a different depth and a different set of readings from the instruments that are there. And the question is, you know, that might be a very natural application of, gee, I actually want to be swimming through the water column, <laughs> thinking about my, my overview. I'm in Finlayson arm, my context, thinking about how I want to query and zoom and get details. This is helpful, but maybe virtual reality will really help us too. So the idea behind this last one uh, is really that uh, where there is a physical model, where there is a three-dimensional model of the real world, uh, carrying that into your virtual environment uh, so that you drill through that uh, and uh, get to your details in this uh, zoom filter uh, and, uh, and details kind of approach uh, can be a very useful metaphor for uh, getting into there. Another uh, place that uh, is uh, useful is in bioinformatics, uh, but only for some subsets of bioinformatics. Bioinformatics is a huge area. It's an area that I've dug into for the last few years, uh, and you get... Uh, uh, yeah, lost in the messy, messy details that are in there. And some of it, uh, the DNA analysis, for instance, uh, there's not so much of a physical model that you're tying on to. Uh, and it's not so clear that virtual reality is the, uh, the key savior to uh, uh, digging through those data sets. Uh, in other models, it is, though. For instance, protein uh, uh, folding. Uh, there was a game out of the University of Washington called Fold It uh, a couple years ago, uh, which is a 2D game you play on a desktop, and you're uh, trying to play with the protein folding to tie them together. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, it's really a kind of clumsy interface, and you're kind of inferring the 3D structure uh, by the way that you're manipulating uh, the, uh, the model on your screen, on a 2D screen. Uh, this is the type of problem that could be very amenable to a virtual reality treatment. Uh, because of the uh, greater naturalness of, uh, uh, of using your arms in a three-dimensional way, uh, you're in a physical space, uh, uh, you're actually manipulating it. Uh, something by contrast that would not be a good example uh, 
there's this idea in DNA analysis of, cir of circuit plots. Uh, uh, this is a uh, circular plot uh, where you show the different chromosomal uh, uh, DNA uh, and uh, where uh, uh, for each of those chromosomes, uh, you're, uh, uh, oh, I can't zip forward, sorry. Um, for each of those chromosomes, uh, you are uh, drawing these uh, traces uh, uh, of uh, what uh, translations and what movements uh, of DNA in a uh, cancer tumor was existing. Uh, and so it's a uh, very synthesized uh, view of a, uh, a, of a whole bunch of DNA migrations, uh, but there's not much uh, inherent physicality behind it. Uh, and the third dimension of data there actually doesn't provide m much benefit to you. Uh, and so I would argue that uh, a, a circuit plot, uh, uh, when put into a virtual environment, uh, ha as has been done here on the Gaming Engine Crisis, uh, uh, is really just eye candy. Uh, that uh, is really not something that's amenable to a uh, VR treatment. Uh, so you really have to look at the uh, problem you're trying to solve and whether it's an appropriate problem to take advantage of that third data dimension uh, and advantage of the uh, interaction style of being in this simulated uh, uh, physical environment. So now I'm going to I'm going to claim that those demands are there, or at least we're seeing them again from our students and from our stakeholders. Um, and we've experienced the uh, the joy of gee, this could make a difference, and also the realization of wow, you know, if you put a pie a pie chart in virtual reality, it's still a pie chart. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're learning along the way. Hopefully that's helpful to you. But here's the real ki kicker for this community, I think. And it's about the fact that the tool chain um, is something that I think we could really participate in. Um, you could look back at how it all maybe all started was with a, a virtual reality markup language. Uh, which was very descriptive about the environment. When we move forward, we go into, from there, the Unreal Engine. Maybe a lot of people have heard of that or have used it. A very rich API, um, lots of learning curves there, C++. They did do a visual uh, interface overlay for um, in about 2014, but very limited. So again, you know, not necessarily a very friendly space to get into right away, especially when your students are new uh, to programming and they're trying to learn Unreal Engine 4. Um, Unity is maybe something that, um, and again, people might be familiar with this, much more of a framework, much more something where there is a community that are developing plugins for things like navigating through a virtual world. There's many different ways in which this could be the componentized, modularized version um, that we might be able to sink our teeth into. There's all sorts of courses that are showing up out there. The boot camps are coming. <laughs> the boot camps in Seattle are out there right now. HoloLens, Unity, you name it, you get into it. And again, I think uh, they're, they're, they're successful or they're getting a lot of students in there. <laughs> so one of the things that's interesting to me about the Unity environment uh, is that it is this componentized environment. Uh, so you have vendors out there who are uh, for instance, this Immerse uh, a, a, a company uh, has made uh, some of the interactions in the lab that I showed you, uh, a, a, where you did that teleport, uh, or where you could actually uh, interact and uh, talk with someone. Uh, they've built components that you can pull out of the, uh, a, 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 the store or the Unity a, a component library uh, and just plug into your application. Uh, and so this idea of your virtual reality development environment being a framework environment where you don't have to write all the pieces from the ground up uh, is an incredibly important one uh, for the sake of uh, uh, of uh, having a, uh, an end-to-end -end solution for virtual reality. But still, there's a lot of the things you depend upon uh, in virtual reality uh, in terms of making a smart application uh, that don't appear in these frameworks. Uh, and as you get into a uh, virtual environment, the expectation is, is that it is uh, much more of a natural interaction. Uh, and so some of these technologies like speech recognition, uh, like natural language understanding, uh, like uh, conversational agents, uh, they all become uh, not just a nice to have like they would be in a desktop uh, interface, uh, but almost a requirement uh, in that the uh, uh, affordances of a uh, virtual environment, uh, when it's feeling so real and so natural like uh, just being in this room with someone, you expect it to interact in the way the natural world interacts with you. Uh, you expect it to be more real. Fortunately, we're coming into an era where uh, these are uh, coming, uh, technologies are coming along incredibly quickly. Uh, you may have seen last week, uh, I was at uh, Microsoft Research for about a decade uh, working with this, uh, this team, and they just put out an announcement uh, uh, saying that uh, they had surpassed human understanding and conversational speech recognition for the first time. This is on the switchboard path, so it's in a uh, very limited uh, a field of conversational understanding. Uh, but at least in this limited switchboard task, uh, uh, the computer can understand better than, uh, uh, than I can understand or you can understand. Uh, and uh, this is a big milestone. Uh, 
this isn't it. It's not just uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the the speech recognition piece of it. There's also the uh, natural language piece that uh, comes in here. Uh, but you've already been talking to your systems uh, uh, through things like Siri and Alexa, where you're giving commands to your system. Uh, when you start to pair this with the uh, higher fidelity of speech recognition that's, that's in there, uh, the greater language understanding capabilities and the evolving conversational agent capabilities, we really are getting towards that day uh, where you can talk to your computer objects in the same way you talk to a uh, person. And this becomes more and more important in this, uh, uh, this virtual environment. Uh, but the cloud services are incredibly <coughs> fragmented at this point. Uh, and so talk about the uh, problem of having a uh, cohesive development tool chain going from uh, a 3D modeling uh, through things like the Autodesk Maya, through uh, Unity game engines, uh, through uh, physics engines that plug into Unity, uh, and now adding on cloud services to all this. Uh, well, it's just a mess. You've got to know all those levels of the stack very, very intimately to create your user experience. And so this is the area that we really can use some, uh, uh, some help in modeling as to how all these pieces tie together. So just to wrap up here with a punchline, <laughs> um, you know, Derek has shown, at least I'm convinced, that again, the devices are there, the demand is there, the uh, tool chains, though, not there. And that's where this community could really, I think, make a difference. Um, and hopefully, as we move into trying to understand this next thing, this user interaction model, um, we can take a look at these questions and at least start to try to answer some of them. So in terms of the prolonged engagement, we really think we can look towards gaming, and many people do, for, gee, yeah, people are really invested in their immersion in these environments, and also to the medical community that are finding, you know, there's something kind of special about being in that environment, and as a human, we can really convince ourselves that it is real, and we do it does have impact. So we are getting somewhere, and, and there's going to be all sorts of challenges that come with these opportunities. You know, we're this isn't a game. We're talking about we want to write serious applications for things like preliminary data analysis. So when we look at gaming and gamification of this interface, you know, what does querying really amount to? And, and what does drilling into the data really kind of uh, match with in this other kind of uh, application? We also have to worry about performance. And performance is going to be an issue for all the reasons that uh, Derek said. And also, no question, certainly lots of things will be brought in that we'll be able to apply. And how is, it, how is that going to play out? If there's any stalling, if there's any glitch, or if there's any anything, it could spoil the whole thing. So can we enable group inter rich group interaction? Well, you know, we found that that was very challenging, actually. And we do think that there's lots of un un unanswered questions in that space as well. When they're showing the full it, if we were all pulling at the same time, your pull and my pull should have impact on each other. And we need to have that all running in real time. We have all of these goals with citizen science, but will we be able to realize these things? And again, performance being an issue. And then the last one, of course, uh, can we use all this motion interactivity uh, to uh, elucidate uh, new data interactions? Uh, does it actually buy you anything to present all this data in this rich environment? Uh, and the answer to this is really sometimes, uh, that uh, in some cases it buys you nothing at all. Uh, if you look at the core visualization community uh, and they're uh, uh, you're talking about 3D interactions, uh, the uh, not quite consensus, but probably a predominant opinion now is 3D is not, not doing anything for you in most visualizations. Uh, um, I'd argue we're in a little bit better situation here because you don't have just the 3D aspect, you've got the interaction aspect, and you can pull on things and tug on them and use these, uh, the, these real interactions. Uh, but it's not proven out, and it's not uh, at the point where you can uh, yeah, use this for everything, and it probably never will be. Uh, but you have to be able to make very physical models of the things you want to interact with to have the affordances of a real world uh, in interacting with them make much sense or, uh, uh, or buy much for you. Um, so with that, we're going to uh, leave this. Uh, yeah, not every problem is a good candidate for VR. The right problems are a great candidate for VR, uh, and uh, the tool chains need a lot of help to uh, make better tools. Uh, Programming yeah. languages could help, too. It's true. <laughs> 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 okay, thank you very much, everybody. I hope if you didn't get a 3D headset, <laughs> we have a few more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I know we're... I've got it. <laughs>